and the southern uh, two thirds has become Muslim. And actually, this is over the eighth to the eleventh centuries of Muslim rule. This is what is often called the golden age of Spain. Things were mostly good for the Spanish Jews. I'm not going to go into detail, but there were times it wasn't as good. Um, but overall, it was, and it was a time of flourishing culturally and in food ways as well. So at the peak, probably about half a million Jews lived in Spain, which was more than any other place in the world. It was the center of Judaism and Jewish life at, in, during the medieval times, which is often forgotten, you know, everyone kind of looks at the Ashkenazic, the Eastern European, or they look to the Middle East. The Iberian Peninsula was the center of Jewish life for several hundred years. This, by the way, is the barrio or the Juderia. Um, and in Ladino, which is the language of the Spanish Jews, uh, with all kinds of different languages mixed in. I'll talk in a minute about that. But you would say Juderia, not Huderia. So the J is pronounced. Um, and so this is so interesting. This, if any of you have been to Girona, it's about 60 miles north of Barcelona. It has one of the best preserved um, medieval Jewish quarters in Europe. It's very worth seeing. And it has a very notable Jewish museum as well. And it's a beautiful city. Um, now, what's important about this wonderful time is that Jews and Muslims, until they were became, and this is later in the 1300s when they were put into these kind of neighborhoods or barrios or however you want to call it, it wasn't a walled, it wasn't like in, um, in uh, Rome where the Jews were actually walled off and it was gated. It was just, they were gathered together in one area. Um, and what's important is that the Jews and the Muslims really began to share food ways. They had similar tastes, interestingly. And so they had uh, the pleasure of learning from each other. They had similar tastes in spices and vegetables, alliums like um, uh, onions, shallots, garlic, and the Christians did not. Also, neither the Jews nor the Muslims eat pork and how meat is handled, kosher and halal have a lot in common. So Muslims understood the Jews and the Jews understood the Muslims in many ways, including food. Um, and what's interesting is you really start to see this crossing of borders and multiple influences on the food of the Jews of Spain besides the Muslim influence because life in Spain was so much better for the Jews under Muslim rule than it was across the rest of Europe that there was migration into Spain by Jews who were living in terrible conditions um, in other parts of Europe. And so they brought their own traditions and their own foods and, and they also learned and adapted from the Jews who were already there. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, you start to really see the exchange. And that's one thing about food. I don't know how you could ever talk about food as being pure, you know, in the sense that it doesn't have influences beyond the original because food travels. We know what the Silk Road did for food and spices. So food travels. Now, quickly moving in 1210, you can see how small um, now the, uh, the region of the Caliphate, which is in the uh, brown at the south, is starting to shrink. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're starting to see things change. And, um, whoops, this just is interesting to take a look because it shows the roots um, where all the Spanish Jews went or, and the Sephardim. It also shows. Um, some of the other like uh, the dates of, of um, expulsions. So like Jews were expelled from England in 1290. So they had to find other places to go. And so you just see this whole movement. So obviously whenever people left their homes, they had their foods and they would try of course to keep some, to maintain some of that. This is, um, was a synagogue. And you can see it was built in 1138 when the Jews were still doing okay, even though the Christians were starting to um, reconquer 
the Reconquista was happening uh, in terms of taking over lands from the Muslims. But this was converted to a church as all the synagogues, most of the synagogues that ever existed in Spain are either gone, they were converted to churches, or there's occasionally, and this week there was a very interesting story about one that they think is part of what was a bar. And that they think they, that some archeologists think they've discovered evidence that this um, used to be a synagogue that was housed in part of this building, the oldest part of the building. So I, they're doing tests now and, and work on that. So what happens, um, 1411, by the way, the Inquisition is already going on. The Inquisition started in the second part of the 1300s, which a lot of people again don't know. And then it culminated in some ways with the Alhambra decree, which is the 1492, the Edict of Expulsion. So this led to more people who became conversos, practiced Judaism outwardly, but secretly maintained some of their Judaism often through food. Um, and I wanted to show you, this is the edict itself, which is kind of fun to see. By the way, it was formalized in Portugal, which was by then um, its own country. It was formalized there in 1536. And it was exported to Portugal because the king wanted to marry one of Ferdinand and uh, Isabel's daughters. So to do that, they said, well, you got to take the inquisition too, you know? So he did. And it wasn't as terrible um, right away. Uh, the, the, the Inquisition itself was most vicious in Spain from 1480 to 1540, approximately. You know, that gives you some sense of the worst years. All right, so here, so this is a very interesting painting because um, what this shows is a Seder, okay, that was being performed in secret by crypto secret Jews. And, um, it's interesting because it's called the Muranos, and Murano is a very derogatory term that's no longer used. It was accepted in the past. It means swine or pig, and that's what how they, the Jews who supposedly converted, and they were always suspect, um, and obviously sometimes with good reason, um, how they were thought of by Christian society and government. They were called Muranos, so swine. Now, of course, as I said, crypto Jews or conversos for those who converted and crypto Jews for those in secret. This is at the secret Seder and at the moment that there's a visit from the Inquisition. So the Inquisition, if you look at the right side of the screen is represented by the kind of faceless dark figure, okay? And the woman, in the very front, in the chair has fainted from fear now of what, because this could get them all killed. Um, this is more than enough to get them all killed. And the man across the table is grabbing the tablecloth to hide, we think probably to hide the evidence of their food that's on the table that really gives away what they're doing. Um, now, there was, uh, the Haggadah at Passover, and Passover is such a huge food holiday that there's a lot related to it for, in, for Jews. And it's coming up in a few weeks again. Um, so Passover always has huge preparations because you have to eat a special way and you, are, you don't eat anything with leavening and, um, or anything that rises. So now you can see this book. It's such an interesting book. The Golden Haggadah survived. And it survived because it probably was commissioned and belonged to a very wealthy family in Northern Spain. And they kept it for display and to impress people. It wasn't really used. How do we know that it wasn't used? Well, there's no wine or food stains on it. And anyone who's ever seen a Haggadah that's been used more than one year knows. You got evidence of what you ate the year before or the years before. Um, so this is an interesting, and you can see uh, some of the different preparations uh, in terms of there's like the lower um, right corner, there's cleaning happening because this is when you clean your whole house. You want no crumbs left. And then you see the preparation of some meat on the lower left. And so it's an interesting um, 
these are very interesting illustrations because they show us more than we know about food in Jewish life um, than in most sources that we have, which I'll talk about. So this is another illustration. So it's interesting to think about as you look at this and you can see them preparing the sheep. And by the way, it's be, be, being prepared in a kosher way. So the neck has been slit. You slit the neck in one, the juggler in one, so the animal doesn't suffer to make this meat kosher. And you drain all the blood. Jews do not eat any of the blood of animals. And so you drain all the blood out. Um, and so that's happening with this sheep uh, in, in the corner there. Um, now, the question of how many Jews um, there, you know, fled Spain, how many converted, no one knows. The estimate is that someplace between 40,000 and 120,000 Jews fled Spain. Um, and part of the challenge of knowing is that people were leaving for a couple, they were started leaving in the 1200s even, but many in the, certainly once the Inquisition started and there were riots and pogroms and killings in Toledo and Sevilla, and this is in like still the thir late 1300s. Um, and so they, people were st already starting to seek safety. And one of the places they went was the Ottoman Empire. And this is personal because this is my family's story. My family's from Barro, we think, which is a town west of Toledo. Um, and if, you know, Casa is house and Barro means mud. So you've got my last name, Barro Casa. And all of, and it's double R's, the R, double R in Spanish. And all of my Spanish relatives spell it with a double R. And all the brokuses around the world who are connected to uh, any Latin American country or Cuba, spell it with double R. But my family went to the Ottoman Empire. Some brokuses went to Portugal. This is very, very typical, which is why I'm telling you about it. But in, and in the Ottoman Empire, um, it became B-A-R-O-K-A-S because there's no hard C in the language there. And um, when we came to Ellis Island, the K was changed to a C, which is more common in English. So although there are some Baroques in the US, it wasn't changed, most of them were. So what becomes important is what we have to start to think about when people left, what did they take? You know, what could they take with them? And, oops, there we go. Um, one of the things that they took, of course, were religious objects. Here's the Torahs. They also took their language. Um, and the Ladino, the, the medieval Spanish that the Jews were speaking, went with them, but wherever it went, it became a new language. So when you say that you speak Ladino, then you have to say, or Judeo-Spanish, then you say, oh, which one? Greek influence, Italian influence, Turkish influence, Arabic, Arab, you know, there's Arabic Judeo, Spanish. It's, you know, I've been taking a Ladino class to try to learn to speak it better. And honestly, the woman who teaches it is Turkish. So we're learning more what my father probably you know, spoke, but because my family being from Turkey, my grandparents from the Ottoman Empire. But seriously, it's really funny I mean, to look at that chat. No, the word for it is this. No, the word for it is that because it just changed. The food was also what they could carry. They could carry the recipes and they could carry their food ways to their new homelands. And who carried it was the women. And so the women are so primarily responsible for making sure that the home is still a Jewish home wherever they went and one way was food. Now, how do we know about the foods of the Jews of Spain then, other than the golden Haggadah? Um, first, um, I'm sorry, let me just, uh, first we know because of foods that were avoided. For instance, Here's in, and this is written about in poems and songs. Here's, here we have a very famous uh, uh, poem. And if you see at this wedding party, bristly pig, ah, was not consumed. Okay, no pork, suspicious. Not one single scaleless fish went down the gullet of the groom. So you have to have um, scales on fish for it to be kosher. So that's why, you know, shrimp and crab and all that aren't kosher. 
Um, instead, an eggplant casserole with saffron and Swiss chard. To me, that sounds great. And whoever swore by Jesus from the meatball pot was barred. So in other words, whoever took Jesus's name in vain didn't eat the meat. And they ate this wonderful vegetable casserole. We'll talk about these because these were very, very special. Um, all right, so here we move to seeing one more um, plate from the Golden Haggadah. And we see for the Sabbath stew, they're preparing food. And we're going to really get into and talk about the Sabbath stew because it's very influential and very um, illustrates a lot about the food of the Jews of Spain. Um, but first, I just thought, let's talk how else we know about this food. There were no Jewish cookbooks. There were no written records or of recipes um, of Jewish food. So interestingly though, Cervantes has a reference to Seferad and Don Quixote. And at the end of another one of his stories, a poor man yearns to eat a sweet that was favored by the Jews of Spain. So, I mean, and there's been talk over the years that Don Quixote is really a metaphor for the situation of the Jews of Spain. Um, uh, it's a very interesting, it's very interesting look, tilting at windmills and trying to keep things, you know, from going where they're going, which is to bad places. It's very interesting. And there's some suspicion sometimes that Cervantes was Jewish, but I don't think anything's been proved. Um, now, the other way that we know about it is through this very interesting cookbook. So there is a cookbook, and this is just the modern cover of an interpretation um, of it. There's a cookbook that was in Southern Spain in Andalus that came out in the 13th century. And Sarah, you may know the exact date, but uh, it's the 13th century. I think it's the bit, the beginning of the 13th century. Okay, yeah. So this is a, you can see it's very interesting. It says the book of cooking in Maghreb and Andalus. Now Andalus is the South of Spain. Maghreb is the North of Africa. You know, it's Morocco, Libya, and Tunisia makes the Maghreb. And so this is, you can just see that this was the mix of how foods were traveling north and south and back and forth. Um, and uh, the Almohads, by the way, just uh, are the ruling Muslim caliphate. So that's just to know that. Now, this book has six recipes that are considered Jewish some of which like the eggplant is called Jewish eggplant. Um, and it also has a recipe, and this is something that's becoming more well-known as we speak here, it has a recipe for braided bread. And that challenges the Eastern European or Ashkenazic roots to what is the um, Sabbath and holiday, you know, bread, which is challah. And the only difference is that the bread that was made by the Jews of Spain for the Sabbath and holidays was fried. It was fried in oil. And when this moved, what happens was the early Sephardic refugees who moved east, um, fleeing the Inquisition, many went to Italy. And for some reason, this bread took hold in Italy among the Italians and the Jews. And um, they taught how to make this bread. It spread around in Italy and especially in Northern Italy. Well, what does Northern Italy border? It borders Germany and Austria. So in Germany and Austria, this became a baked bread, um, but, <laughs> excuse me, but it, it what, you know, the source traces to the food of the Jews of Spain, and, and it has a lot of Ashkenazic Eastern European Jews a little upset right now um, that this is really being talked about, because they've always claimed that challah was theirs. What is theirs is that what happened was they were prone to wanting to eat this bread, because in Germany, and there was a bread I just forgot the name, Bircher bread or something like that, which is a braided twisted bread. And so by having this braided bread, they could look like their Christian neighbors. They could be like, oh, look, we eat that too. And they're eating it for obviously Shabbat and for holidays, but it made them look like they belonged as opposed to honestly, the food of the Jews of Spain 
which marked the Jews um, and, and created uh, the situation where they actually were persecuted. This is an Inquisition trial. Dunce caps were created as part of the Inquisition. When you were, when you were somebody who was accused at the trial, you had to wear this cap. Um, now, the decrees about the Inquisition include a lot of references to food and customs around food as a way of knowing if a converso was really living as a secret Jew. And why is this important? Because by the time you get to um, the 1400s, especially the mid 1400s onwards, um, a lot of Jews are already starting to either convert, pretend to convert or leave. And certainly by the expulsion, the rest of anyone who was Jewish, they left and so did many conversos uh, and, and crypto Jews. Um, but these Jews, who or the, the, what happened with the Inquisition at this point is it really became about finding out secret Jews. It much more became about finding out who was contaminating the society still, and especially with food. So inquisitors were especially attuned to hearing about the preparation of Shabbat and holiday foods, and also the way ordinary foods are eaten, everyday foods, any um, kind of keeping of kashrut, keeping kosher, uh, draining meat of all its blood, no dairy with the meat, not lighting a fire to cook uh, hot food on Friday night or Saturday. And often maids and neighbors gave testimony uh, against their Jewish masters, um, such as a maid who sees her mistress preparing a meat stew on a Friday and cooking it slowly so the family didn't eat it to Saturday. In just a moment, we're gonna talk at Sadafina. It's a wonderful uh, dish. Also preparing any kind of flatbreads with holes poked in them. That mimics matzah, which is the unleavened bread that's eaten at Passover. And there are stories of people who uh, are living in Texas and New Mexico here in the United States and they don't know why, but once a year for a week, they eat only crackers. And so this we now know really says your family was Jewish. Your ancestors were Jewish. And this was passed down as a way of marking that, even though they were Jews in secret. Um, even, interesting, oops, interestingly, even a salad uncooked of lettuce and radishes was used against a woman named Juana Nunez at her trial in the early 1500s because she served it to women friends who came to visit um, nearly every Saturday afternoon. So they were eating uncooked food, first of all, which the Christians did not do as a rule. And it was on Saturday, hmm, no fire lit, uh, but also they were relaxing and not taking care of their households at that time. So that was damning testimony and she was killed. Um, so here's the references of some of the things, um, how a crypto Jewish family cooked at night for a holiday, for, uh, for Yom Kippur. Um, so th this is from a great book called The Drizzle of Honey the lives and recipes of Spain's secret Jews. And if you're interested in any of this, you should definitely get a hold of that book. We're going to cook a recipe out of it in a little bit, um, which is uh, uh, a verduras, greens, which were very big among the Sephardi. Um, all right, I want you to just take note of when this is. It's in 1678. This is still going on. The Inquisition lasted a long time and and, um, and people were being caught just living their everyday lives because of the food. All right, so now let's get into the specifics of the food. Um, the food and the flavors of the Sephardic Jews have endured. This cuisine really lives on today in many places. So some of the components, you know, we talked about that back and forth with the Muslims. So some of the components of Jewish cuisine were introduced to Iberia following the Moorish conquest in 711. And they became part of um, Sephardic cuisine and they're recognizable as 
being common in Sephardic cooking and influences on other cuisines today. What are some of these? The prevalent use of rice, oranges, artichokes, eggplants, almonds, meat chopped or ground into meatballs. Okay, so that came up uh, from the North Africa. Seasoning such as caraway and capers, saffron for taste and color, sweet cakes and the use of almonds and sweets, rose water and orange water for flavoring. So these were all things that influenced Sephardic cuisines and still do. Um, for, uh, in Spain, also, Jews and conversos were often identified with the consumption of cured fatty fowl, such as goose and duck, um, because the Christians did not love that. And curing it was a way for the Jews to maintain co keeping kosher, even though, uh, and, and not seeming that they are doing it. There was so that it, the blood was gone from it and all of that. Now, let's talk about Adafina. This is um, the, a really nice laid out, gives you all the idea of the ingredients that went into an adafina. And um, it was very interesting that pork was used a lot to ferret out Jews. In fact, there's the whole thing about that, um, you know, pork wasn't used as much in Spain until they wanted to really figure out who was really Jewish. And then every place started serving for pork and everybody started eating it all the time so that it, as a way to let, you know, find out if someone's Jewish. Um, so the Jews had ways of getting around it. They made pork cutlets and then for, they would make them from chicken or from pounded or from breaded eggplant. And I saw um, recently a story where they, the way that they would make the bone for the cutlet was often charred toast. And so this would give their neighbors that look like, hey. Um, and in, in Portugal, there's a famous sausage and I'm really sorry, I forgot the name and didn't write it down uh, for this, but. Hmm? They're called Aleidas. The sausage that looks like it's made the same, but it, it, with pork but it isn't, it's made with um, goose, if I remember right, is it goose? Yeah. Or chicken sometimes. And sometimes chicken, yeah. So another um, tradition was to make goose or duck ham. And this tradition continues today, especially in parts of Catalan, which is uh, in the Northwest, including Girona and Barcelona. And so, um, it was very interesting that they'd cure the meat and create this ham that took the place of salt pork in cooking so that it would start to give some of the smoky taste and the appearance of having used pork, but obviously not. So this would happen with adafina sometimes um, just to give that appearance. So the cured goose known to, as Jewish ham also appears by the way in Spanish poetry. So here's the ingredients for an adafina, and here's another adafina finished. Um, wait, <clears throat> let me just see. Okay, <clears throat> so there's eggs cooking in this adafina, and that becomes very important. So adafina is the overnight stew, and usually in the north of Spain it was uh, called. Adafina in the south, it was called Hamim because of the Muslim influence from the Jews and the Muslims in, from Morocco and the Maghreb. And it's the overnight Sabbath stew. <coughs> Excuse me. It's one of the most common dishes that was used in Inquisition testimony to ferret out Jews. And in one case, in 1570, inquisitors recorded a maid testifying that she witnessed her employer cooking mutton with oil and onions, which she understands, this is being quoted, is the Jewish dish adafina. So this traditional stew would include meat, chickpeas, um, fowl, fava beans, onions, garlic, cumin, other spices, and these hard cooked eggs, which became a tradition of their own. And it, in Eastern Europe, they have something called cholent. And cholent is the overnight stew of the Ashkenazic Jews. And um, it has not even half the ingredients, it has no spices to speak of. And uh, maybe if they're lucky, some white beans or some barley. It's very different and very much blander. Root vegetables are all um, 
that is with the meat and maybe a piece of meat or goose. They didn't have, they were pretty not well off the Jews of Eastern Europe. Um, so I wanted to just talk about this because these are the eggs uh, and I'm kind of obsessed as, as Sarah knows with these eggs. So if you take the hard cooked eggs, nowadays they're cooked, what happens is if you're not making adafina, you can make huevos jaminados anytime. And you make them by cooking a bed of onion skins and peels that you save, put your eggs in and water, cover it with them with water. And some people put coffee grinds. Some families put a little vinegar. Mine never did. We used the coffee, but not the vinegar. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, peppercorns for spicing also. And then after they've cooked for a few hours, because they cook six to eight hours, um, you can go in and crack the shells gently on each one and put them back in the water and you will get patterns like this, which I just absolutely adore. Um, okay. And by the way, the way that the adafina was cooked, which I didn't um, totally explain is it was cooked in the banked coals. So the fire was lit before Shabbat. You put the adafina in and you just bank the coals so that they together around the pot so it stays hot and keeps cooking, like putting it in your oven to cook overnight at 300 or 250 or something. It's the same idea. And some people do roast these eggs in the oven, by the way, at a very low temperature overnight. Um, but I cook them in the water. So um, the most important thing also to think about is adafina is a dish that is so Spanish today. It's served in restaurants, it's served all over. Um, people love it. It's Spanish. And it's so ironic that this is really a, this, the Sabbath stew of the Jews who got kicked out. Um, this is called cuajado. That's one of the names for it. There's many names. Basically, this continues. Eggs were very important to the diet. And there's a long history uh, of egg and vegetable casseroles because the Sephardi made a lot of vegetables. Um, this is, I make mine with um, leeks and a little bit of carrot and potatoes, which are new world. So my version is a little later than, you know, the, the versions earlier that were made with um, eggplant very often, zucchini sometimes, um, leek, Swiss chard, all of the usual uh, ingredients that grew in their gardens or were at the markets. And then tomato or potato were added later um, when they came from the new world. Um, and cuajado was originally made in an iron skillet hanging over the fire, which gave it this great crust on the bottom. And it became it until there were ovens in people's homes. It was fixed. It was fixed this way. Now there's other names. Again, we get into the whole thing of how do we trace a dish when we don't always have the same name for it. So the dish of cuajado is also called as cuajado, meaning coagulated in Ladino. It's also called spongato, meaning sponge. And in especially among Turkish Jews, it will be called amandrote. And that especially is for the dish that is made with either zucchini or eggplant and eggs and some spices and whatever else goes in. So here you have the same dish with four, five, six different names. And so it becomes really interesting to be a food detective and try to figure all that out. Chickpeas, so, so, so important. Um, you've had this dish when I fixed it at, uh, yeah. This is a wonderful dish. Um, chickpeas were grown in Iberia since Roman times. And they were very important for the Jews because they were an inexpensive uh, source of protein. And also they were a source of protein when those riots and killings and destruction of Jewish quarters happened one of the things that was targeted always was the kosher butcher shops, because if you destroy that, the kosher butcher shops, the Jews can't get their food. And so they would eat a lot of chickpeas and chickpea dishes became very, very important and very creative. What's interesting about this dish, which I adore, um, is that it features kind of this sweet savory combination that the Jews in Spain loved. Um, they had, uh, it has, honey, pomegranate syrup, pomegranate juice, uh, cloves, ginger, vinegar 
and you know, vinegar is often used. It's just such an interesting combination. Black eyed peas, um, which has been cultivated since antiquity in Africa, and is the same in Jewish culture still today. The salad is one that I make at um, Rosh Hashanah, just the Jewish New Year, because it's the same as with black eyed peas among the Chinese, in the South in the US, throughout Africa. They have to do with uh, the uh, prosperous new year. Um, we have chard and veggies. Um, chard, uh, spinach, where greens very much favored by Jews. And chard, chard can be eaten raw or cooked. We're going to cook some of it in a minute. And that also was around since the ancient world. And like so much of this food, very healthy, lots of health benefits. Um, salads might include lettuce, which is interesting. Interesting, as well as lavender, purslane, edible, whoops, going the wrong way here, sorry. Edible flowers uh, and radishes. And the dressing in Spain was made from wine vinegar, leftover wine, and sometimes oil. Um, and this was dressings that were in keeping with uh, a meat meal. They could be eaten with any meal. So let's talk about quickly, uh, Sarah, I don't know if you recognize that dish. That's the dish of eggplant and tomato that, that you made. <laughs> We made that outside under the tent at our gathering. Um, eggplant was loved by Sephardi. Um, it probably originated in India or Africa. It still grows wild in both places and it thrives in warm and temperate climates. So it's perfect for the Iberian Peninsula. Um, it was introduced to Spain by the Muslims and probably also Arab traders from around the Mediterranean in uh, the eighth century. And so it had a long time to establish itself as part of Sephardic cuisine. The Christians never took to it. Um, and, and why is that? They held on to the belief that it was poisonous. Okay, they, it's part of the nightshade family and nightshades had trouble gaining a footing among some people um, in the medieval world. Uh, and so they believed it was poisonous or decorative at best. You might grow them because they looked pretty in your garden. Um, and so the other thing to talk about is the tomato because to, the Spanish are credited with bringing the tomato to Europe. And it probably came back uh, in the 1520s with a conquistador. Although some have said that Columbus brought it back, there's the, the evidence generally is that it was in the 1520s with a conquistador. And the Jews were immediate and early adopters of this fruit. And the Europeans thought, again, it was decorative at best and poisonous at worst. So they didn't eat it. And so when we talk about the food that got carried when the Jews left Spain, you look at the tomato, the spread of the tomato is such a great example. They went primarily eastward. So going across Europe, most places, no, didn't want anything to do with the tomato. When they got to the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans said, this is wonderful. And they really took on both eggplant and tomatoes. And there's this wonderful marriage between um, Ottoman cuisine, and the cuisine of the Sephardic Jews. They really have over the centuries continue, you know, just really complemented each other, learned and grown from each other. And um, the tomato did not become popular in Italy until the second half of the 16th century. It was quite a ways down the road. So the late 50, you know, so after about 50 years after it was introduced um, by the Spanish. Um, now, the alliums like um, onions, leeks, shallots, garlic, they were smelly and the food of poor people. So the um, Christians didn't want anything to do with them. And by the way, they could get, again, the inquisition would come after you if you use them. There were lots of herbs used, very easy to grow all year round in your home garden, parsley, cilantro, fennel. Um, saffron, citron leaves, bitter herb called rue, which I tried growing one time and boy, is it bitter. Um, mint and thyme, uh, spices, cinnamon, cloves, cumin, ginger, nutmeg, and salt. Um, interestingly, there's the famous salt cod that the Jews would use, um, baklao, and the, also in um, Portugal, it became because of being on the water, 
um, uh, so much of Portugal, this preserving fish and salt was something that the Jews did a lot. Um, and the spice combinations were things that could seem very unusual to us today. Uh, for instance, there's a salsa fina, that's ginger, cinnamon, pepper, cloves, um, mace, nutmeg, and saffron. So most of us wouldn't put those together, but it, they're delicious, truly. Um, oil and vinegar, as we mentioned, mostly olive oil and vinegar was very important. The um, Sephardic Jews love the taste of vinegar. They would sprinkle them on their verduras, on their greens. Um, and also it contributed to making sweet and sour dishes like meatballs that the Jews also love. Cheeses, the thing to talk about with cheese is, you know, Spanish cheese is fabulous. The thing is that um, the Jews had to make their own cheese to make sure that there was no animal rennet in it. And so they ate many of the same cheeses, like a very fresh creamy cheese. It's like a queso fresco, uh, hard cheeses like manchego, but they made their own. And so let's talk about tapas because this is such an interesting, so top, topic, it's like tapas, Jews love to snack on appetizers and small dishes. Okay, especially during family gatherings on that Saturday afternoon uh, or during holidays, same as Muslims enjoyed their meze. So there was a marriage again of these two uh, cultures and cuisines. So there's, they would be served, these little dishes would be served in dishes with lids because kitchens weren't in the house. They were outside of the house generally. And so you'd have to carry all these little dishes on a tray or whatever often outside across the courtyard to where people were eating and gathering. And so they have these little lids or tapa on top of the dishes. And so this introduced the Spanish at large to the custom of tapas or small appetizers. Um, or if you want, they can make it your meal. And it's very interesting that tapas became very um, uh, big food in bars and inns, especially on Sunday afternoons when the men would gather and after mass, after going to church, the women would take the kids and go home and take care of their families and the men would go to bars and eat tapas and drink. Um, and common tapas of Sephardic origin that are still eaten in Spain include cheese dumplings, yogurt soup, fried pumpkin, pickled and preserved fish, um, it, like anchovies and vinegar, uh, olives, cheeses, fruit, and simple salads, like we talked about with radishes, onions, leeks, roux, for instance. Um, ham was used then once it went, became popular among the Christians because, you know, if you didn't eat the ham, you were Jewish. So fish on Friday seems to have come also from a Spanish uh, Jewish tradition of eating fish. The Portuguese, it said that the first fish and chips shop in London was started by a Portuguese man descended from Jews. And that's because fried fish was a big thing among the Jews of Spain. And here I wanna show you, um, uh, let me, I think this is out, yeah. The motto Chinos and um, uh, Turon. So we have two things. Desserts with almond and almond paste were beloved. And that this is because they had a lot of flavor they were very accessible and they were parv, which means they could be eaten with meat meals or they could be eaten with dairy meals. And so marzipan, for example, in Toledo, the famous Toledo marzipan, the most famous, is still made from a well-preserved Jewish recipe. And when I was in Toledo a few years ago, I walked into a bakery on the main square and there was the Torta Judea. It was this Jewish tort, and what was it? It was a thin layer of marzipan with a crust underneath and up the sides. And that was the Jewish tort. So um, the other, this is marochinos, which is a cookie that we're gonna whip up in a minute. Um, we're just about ready for the kitchen. Um, and this traces back of, to that time. Um, it's very easy to make. And uh, this is just with almond meal and we'll talk about it in the kitchen more. These are the turon. Turon is famous in Spain, famous, and it was first made by Jews. And the white, it's so interesting. Turon is hard to make because you have to work with egg whites and sugar, 
which get hard very quickly. And so you have to work very, very quickly to make the Turon. But there are many companies today that make Turon. Some are descended from Jews and some aren't. And um, it's a really popular treat that Spain is known by. So this is, I couldn't leave out fried food. Uh, this is Bumuelos or Bunuelos or Binuelos, depending on where you are. These are some that uh, I've made. Um, this is sometimes called the Sephardic or Turkish beignet because they became very popular in the Ottoman Empire. But if you think about it, um, you know, the fried treats, think about where you've had them, like in Mexico, sopapilla. Sopapillas are Bunuelos carried by um, conversos to Mexico and they showed up there with same with the drizzled honey um, sauce on it. And um, also it's a quintessential Mexican winter holiday dish is golden deep fried balls of cheese infused dough. And also that in Latin America with and without the cheese. And these are descended from Jews, conversos who went to the new world. There's also something called pan de semita, Semitic bread, um, which is this iconic sesame seed studded roll in Mexico's Puebla region. And this is linked to secret Jews who might have eaten it, the thinking is, as an alternative to regular bread during Passover, because this is a little different. Um, and um, so this is you know, something very iconic in Mexico, parts of Mexico that came from the Jews. Last, I want to talk a little bit quickly about sponge cake. Um, this is pan de España, literally called the bread of Spain, which is actually sponge cake. And um, it was probably baked around the year, first baked around the year 1000, when people started to use eggs to make cakes rise. So before that, eggs were, I mean, cakes were fairly flat. Uh, they, you know, you would put things in them to try to bulk them up. But once eggs could be used more, um, it became popular. This sponge cake became popular in so many places. And you can make it for the Jewish holiday of Passover. This is actually that version that does not use flour, but uses cake meal and potato starch. And sponge cake became part of many cultures around the world. Um, Tres Leches cake in Mexico uses the sponge cake, Pan de España, that came uh, with the um, conversos. And um, it's the most popular versions are made without butter because that keeps it kosher. And if you're wondering who that lovely man in the picture is, that's my father, my poppy. Um, and I just, you know, to close, I want to just say that I never understood my poppy's obsession with sponge cake. I started when I was around eight or nine, I would make him sponge cake. That's all the cake he ever wanted me to make. Um, birthdays, holidays, whatever, we had sponge cake. He did, I, I had chocolate cake, but he had sponge cake. Um, why? Now, I never understood where this came from. I just thought, okay, it tastes good with his coffee. And then once I was actually in my mid thirties and I moved to New York from Denver and there was many more Sephardic Jews and I became involved in the community and found, started to really do some research, well, that's when I found out that I have ancestors who, who ate sponge cake, you know, basically. And that this actually is such an incredible um, uh, example of how enduring food can be, how food can travel. So my ancestors went from Spain to either Portugal or Ottoman Empire. From there, they went in my direct line to New York but others went to Cuba, uh, South America, all Italy. Um, and then we here we were in Denver making sponge cake that had first been made in the Iberian Peninsula a thousand years before. So I just want to close by saying thank you. And also that tomorrow would be my, or is my father's 100th birthday. And so I am, feel like I'm dedicating this talk and dem cooking demo in his honor today. Um, and he would love to be able to eat the food and talk about it. So we're gonna go in the kitchen. I'm gonna stop my share and we're gonna head in. 
for a little bit of quick cooking. Let me just turn off my. Great. And as Susan is transferring over to her kitchen, I just want to say I know that there were some issues with the Zoom link. So my apologies for that. Um, but we have been recording this. So for those who missed the beginning and want to see it, um, there will be a recording for you. Um, and I will be sharing again in the chat um, one of the recipes for manoncinos that Susan is going to be making right now. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or um, save them to the end and we can, I can call on you. Okay. All right. Take it away, Susan. Oh, you're still muted, Susan. Okay. How's that? We're good? Perfect. All right. So I, um, I make Montecinos all the time. Partly they're gluten-free and I have a niece who eat gluten-free, but I also, they're just so good. And um, they're so simple. Literally, this is two cups of almond meal. Now, Sarah and I have a little difference here because she learned that marochinos were made with wal ground walnuts. And uh, what was the word for it? Almendrados are the ones. Almendrados were the ones that the cookies or, or kind of macaroon like cookie that was made with almond meal. I have never encountered that. So all, so it's really interesting that even this one little cookie has these differences. Everyone I know, but no, they're from all over Turkey and many different places. They, we call them monochinos, but that's an almond cookie, but who's to say? And who's to say who changed it in which way? It could have been one cook, one family, we don't know. Um, so what you do, and again, Sarah's preparation is also different. This is almond meal. And I, to be honest, I buy it at Trader Joe's because it's the easiest. I don't make my own. Sarah's much more ambitious. She makes her own. Um, this is unblanched and unpeeled. Now, some people will blanch them if they want a whiter cookie. But most of the time, this is how it was. It, my understanding of the original recipe was unblanched and unpeeled. And all I'm doing is adding a third of a cup of sugar. Now, I have much less sugar in here. You can imagine that it was at least a cup in the past. Oh, and I'm also adding a pinch of salt because that helps me know the flavor. So I'm just whisking it together. But the thing that's so interesting is, you know, all these recipes were so sweet. And even today's many recipes. And I have been experimenting with cutting sugar. And honestly, these are delicious. And what I love about it is they're not so sweet so that afterwards, as you saw in the picture, they can get a nice bath of powdered sugar over them and you're not gonna just cringe from the sweetness. All right, so this is mixed. So this is like, we're, we're halfway there. Um, so this is five egg whites. And all you do is add to the egg whites some almond extract, a teaspoon. And you can go a little lighter on this, which I do because I'm not a huge fan. I tend to go like maybe seven, eight, you know, but a little lighter. And then I also add a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Okay. And that I like, so I'm, I do a lot of that. That's a full spoon. All right. And then the, we are going to take the whisk and just beat these up. Only until it's foamy. You're not going for peaks or anything like that. You're just going for foamy. All right. And you can see that this was so easy and quick, you know, to make. And it, it's not expensive either. You could make these in a toaster oven, which I have. So if you want a treat there, we're almost there. It's about 15 seconds, 20 seconds at the most. Okay. You can see it's all foamy and mixed together. And now you take a wooden spoon, okay? And you want to take a wooden spoon, preferably, because wooden spoons have a reason. They're so flat, they really help things mix quickly. And what we want to do is put this in, and we only want to mix it as much as we need to mix it to combine it, to make everything wet. And that's it. Then you want to stop. Sorry, I'm just gonna start to heat up. Oh no, I don't need to yet, sorry. Okay. 
So here we have, and just scrape it all down. Almost there. If you over mix these, they get kind of tough. You know, it's a that that's the story with a lot of things. Me, other things too. If you over mix, it can get tough. So just enough so that everything is blended. And this is not like when you work with egg whites. Use the back of the spoon also to mush and blend quickly. Okay, we're done. Now, what you want to do is take two teaspoons. This is the easiest way to do this. This is kind of a little bit of a loose batter. It's a very moist cookie or kind of macaroon almost. All right, I'm going to burn this space. So all that you do is you use, it's really, uh, let me do this over on this side so you can see. You use the two spoons to work together. And so you get everything on the spoon. It's just a teaspoonful. You slide it on and it's almost round. You can take a little time to round it off if you like. And then you just smooth the top a little and you make a disc. So it's a little bit flattened, but it's not skinny. All right, we're gonna do that again. Hopefully a similar size. And they don't spread a whole lot at all, just a little. So they can be fairly close. All right, there we go. So I'm just gonna do a few and then we're gonna pop them in the oven. Um, because I want you to see how they cook. And we'll be cooking the verduras, the greens, but halfway through these cooking, you need to rotate them. And usually I do two sheet pans. I do them all at once. And <clears throat> I will also change the, the, where the sheet pans are in the oven. So move top to bottom and bottom to top and turn front to back and all of that. And that's because these are delicate in the way they cook. And if your oven isn't perfect, they will reflect that. All right, I'm Susan, gonna... I have a question oh. for you. Um, yeah, I was about to ask if there were any questions. Yes, yeah. So I have a question. So my, you know, we have our we have our recipe differences, right? Where I have I call them almendrados and you call them maronchinos. But in my recipe, I also it doesn't have almond extract. And I, um, I blanch the almonds and I put them in a food processor. Do you think that that recipe doesn't have almond extract in it because I'm blending the almonds like fresh or it, like, can you explain a little bit more the addition of almond extract? So honestly, what I think is um, that this is not an original recipe totally because it, the extract probably wouldn't have been used Instead, and I really want to start experimenting with this, I think some almond paste would have been used and mixed into the cookie. Right, so um, like puron or, or marzipan, yeah. Yeah, some people will add uh, a little cinnamon to the cookie, but um, you know, the, the tastes were very different uh, 500, 600, 700 years ago. And so I think this is, kind of adapted for modern taste. Um, I'm gonna stop there and I wanna show you how to decorate. So that's what I think. And I think that not having almond extract is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. What do you put in yours? Um, mine are, you blanch the almonds and you process them in a food processor. And then you put two whole eggs. It's not just egg whites, it's two whole eggs um, the zest of a lemon and sugar, and then you actually let the the mixture sit overnight, and then okay. you burn them and bake them. I would love to see your recipe. You have yeah. to say <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to compare. Absolutely, it's very different. But you know, there's probably literally thousands of recipes for this cooking. You know, it's just because everybody made it their own way when they were in Spain. And then when you leave, you go all over, you adapt ingredients, you know. So often you have things like, oh, you know, someone someplace in your ancestry didn't really like lemon. And so they took it out of the cookie. And so all these people now don't know that there was lemon in the cookie originally. That happens all the time with recipes and food. I just wanted to show you, you can decorate these very simply with either a whole almond or you could take a, a nice slice and just lay it on the top and that's it 
Now I'm just going to pop these in the oven. Um, you can see how quick that was. I think it took all of like 10, 12 minutes. All right, and we'll move that in 10 minutes. Let me set a timer and let's start cooking our greens. So aside from absolutely loving greens, um, this dish is so interesting because it's basically, you can have it either, uh, you can have the shard and the green raw, or you can have them cooked. And I just wanted to show you, this is the book that is quite wonderful. You can see I use it a lot. There's all kinds of tabs on it. But this is the book that I got the recipe for the greens out of. It's called Maria Sanchez's Greens. Maria has kind of a sad story. She was the widow of a butcher um, of Guadalupe. And she ended up being uh, tried. And I, by the way, I'm putting not so much, maybe a tablespoon not even two of olive oil, whereas in the book it says up to three, and to me that's too much oil. Um, but she, it was really sad because she was accused um, and tried in, 15, in 1485, 86. And the most damaging testimony came from her daughter Inez, um, who was also a prisoner who didn't realize that she was basically selling out her mother with some things that she said. And the principal witness against Maria other than her daughter, was a serving girl who had become the confidant of her daughter. And so it's really sad. So you can, and I just to also mention that um, the term, the Spanish term verduras, I'm reading from the book, encompasses any edible green grown in the garden. The greens could have been eaten raw or cooked, sprinkled with vinegar, or perhaps vinegar and oil. It is common in modern day Spain to sprinkle vinegar over cooked green vegetables that discharge. So there you have your evidence. Now what I am doing, this just says, by the way, it's so it's a great recipe, big bunch of greens. So what I did was I have a mixture of spinach and Swiss chard, two bunches, as you, we all know how this cooks down. So, um, and what I'm gonna do actually after this class, when I go to eat these for dinner is I will add some chickpeas to them which is a Turkish dish. I'm sure that also the Jews in Spain must have done this at some point, but I learned that dish many, many years ago and have loved it since. And then you can add in, what I'm gonna do first is I always chop up, they don't say to do this in the recipe, but these beautiful stems are going in and do they just need to cook a little longer? And Susan. So, Here's a question in the chat. Do you use Spanish olive oil? What, what olive oil do you use? This is a, med a Mediterranean blend. I very often, honestly, um, depends on, I, you know, kind of depends on what I'm doing with it. This is a very kind of neutral olive oil. It's not, it doesn't have a strong taste, but as it got hot, it still had that lovely uh, scent that you get from nice olive oil as it heats up. So that's good. Um, I like Spanish olive oil a lot. I also, honestly, Trader Joe's, I feel I sound like an ad, sells an organic Tunisian olive oil. That if you like your olive oil, it's just a little bitter, it's really good. And I like that. I like to use it in salad dressings because it kind of has a really nice edge. Um, but I don't use just Spanish. So. And then just another quick question about the cookies that I saw in the chat. Um, just could you remind us what oven temp you are cooking the cookies on? 325. 325, thank you. So it's low. Um, and actually, interesting, I'll show you, I made some. Okay. These are some that I made last night for class I did. And what's interesting, what, they're very moist. Okay, this is a moist cookie. What I like to do if I'm going to serve them is I will pop them back in the oven for like three minutes, just to kind of give them that crustiness again and soft on the inside, you know, so they're not quite so soft and moist. They are quite delicious like this. I had to taste test this morning and make sure they were still good. Um, Natural. But, yeah. <laughs> But, and there aren't so many people on this call, on this Zoom. So 
If people want to unmute and you have questions or comments, feel free to at this point. I mean, this is like, couldn't be simpler. And I'm just waiting for the stems to get a little bit cooked. If you don't want to use the stems, um, save them for something else. Obviously, don't throw them out. But um, if you don't want to, then you would just dump the greens straight in. But we're waiting a minute. Oh, and I just wanted to mention the other thing that I decided you could use a number of different herbs. You can use onion, garlic, whatever you want. I decided to use shallot today. You can use, uh, here's what the book talks about. Chopped chives or onions, chopped fresh margarine, chopped fresh oregano, uh, fresh dill or fennel. This would, this would be great with fennel. I'm gonna have to try that. Um, a tablespoon of chopped nasturtium leaves. If any of you have not eaten nasturtium, the flowers, they're wonderful. I grow some in the summer always because they're beautiful and they're edible and delicious. Um, and some chopped fresh basil. So I happen to have basil. So uh, we're adding basil. That's what I have. Um, and you can certainly make up and add whatever flavors you want. I'm gonna go ahead and add the shallot minced up just because I'd like for it to cook just a moment because the greens cook so fast and you want to barely, you don't cook them very much. They're not like cooked to the point of limp. Yeah. So are there any other questions or anybody have any comments? No? Please feel free to unmute if you do or you can submit it in the chat and I will ask it. And if you have a comment also, something you've eaten that reminded you of something I talked about today, I'd love to know. Um, yeah, or if you've actually eaten Sephardic food. And Sephardic is a great big umbrella because it's supposed to mean that it, it comes from people who originated in Spain, the Jews of Spain. But nowadays Sephardic is an umbrella for almost everything that's not Eastern European Ashkenazic. So, they still, we still use the term Mizrahi, which refers to Jews from Persia, um, Iraq, Yemen. We, they've kind of gotten mushed together. They also used to have more distinct identities, but uh, Jews from Arab speaking lands are generally referred to as Mizrahi. And these are people who never went to Spain, the ancestry. All right, good. The Sephardic Ashkenazi divide. Um, Susan, I do have a question for you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I know you're gonna, you're expecting this question. Um, if you could talk a little bit about what it was like cooking for the White House satyrs and maybe about, did you introduce any Sephardic twist to that? Like what was the, the White House Seder? Yeah, um, by the way, I'm just, it says to just go ahead and put all the greens and the herbs in. So I'm going to do that while we're talking. It was beyond awesome. Very nerve wracking. Um, spreading it out all over my stove. Um, the first year I did it three years. The first year I did it was um, not a lot of influence. I One dish went on the menu that I had suggested, which was um, a Moroccan chicken with olives and preserved lemon. So yes, I introduced some new flavors. There it was next to the brisket, you know. Um, and then the second and third year, they trusted me. And so I added Moroccan harosic balls, which are dried fruit and nuts ground up and made into this lovely ball. It's the best of us. It's so good. And I also added, um, the huevos laminados, the long cooked eggs, which threw everyone off. As I walked into the kitchen at nine o'clock in the morning, the kitchen in the White House and said, okay, we got to get these eggs cooking. Where are the eggs? Where's the big pot? You know, and they're like, you're making hard boiled eggs. You don't need them until six o'clock tonight. I'm like, oh yeah, but these have to cook for eight hours. They were just stunned. Um, it was so much fun. And can you remind us uh, which which Seder, which president you cooked for? Oh, I was with President Obama. Yeah. It was, he has been to many Seders in his life. And um, on the campaign trail, a couple of his aides were 
having a little Seder, I think with Maxwell House, I got them and a box of matzah and a bottle of wine and a can of macaroons that one of their mothers had sent down the campaign trail. And um, it was really funny. He, he participated, discovered that they were doing this and participated. And at the end of the Jewish Seder, you say next year in Jerusalem, and he said, next year in the White House. And, you know, when we're there, we're doing a Seder every year. And he did. Okay. I just now is the time when I mentioned take back and turn it front to back and give it 10 more minutes. They just get slightly, slightly kind of golden brown on the bottom. That tells you they're done. All right. I could be using tongs for this too, but um, all right, so all we're going to do, is it says to cook briefly, so I'm just trying to make sure it's pretty evenly cooked. Okay, and the shallots and stems are mixed throughout. Um, yeah, and actually they were so appreciative. It happened because Michelle Obama wanted more green and healthy at the Seder. She, so she said, please go find a guest chef. And I had met the Jewish outreach person. And the funny thing is, I was very new to being a food professional. I'm a home cook. I've been cooking since I was a very young girl. But only in 2012 did I become a professional when I uh, started Jewish food experience and started cooking and going on TV and doing demos and all that. And then, and I never had professional training. And this is 2014, and I'm like, yeah, I can cook at the White House, sure. Well, it worked. And the big secret is I made gefilte fish from scratch there because that was on the menu. They wanted their gefilte fish, although I introduced one that had a lot of herbs and watercress and stuff in it. It was so good. A little salt going in. And then I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of vinegar. And we're just going to let it cook for a moment more and it will be done. This is a wonderful, simple, simple dish. You can see how quick. So both dishes are being done with me talking in less than a half hour. All right, this is done. I guess, you know, I could taste, but I think we're having done this many times. And you don't see, you see what I was talking about? It's not cooked to the point of everything being limp. You know, it still has some body. If you kept cooking, it would keep shrinking as the water cooked out more and more. And it would just go real squishy. Mmm. Mmm. It looks so good, that? Susan. <laughs> I wish we could smell it. Well, the touch of vinegar is really lovely. And it, you know, that's like I said, the vegetables in Spain in restaurants and homes often are served with vinegar sprinkled on them. And you should try it because it really brings out the flavor. It's not a lot, doesn't, and by also when it's cooked like this, you know, I cooked it a moment more with the vinegar. There's no sharpness left. There's none of that kind of vinegary that you don't like because it's got that, yeah. So we're putting it into, just because everything should always look good when you serve it. All right, so there's one. All right. Um, anyway, so I will say one thing though, um, more about the White House, not to, you know, keep talking about it, but it was fun. Um, when I was cooking the second year and I was standing at one of the steel islands in the middle of this, not that big of kitchen, you would be shocked very efficient, but not big. It's in the bottom. The only part of the White House that didn't burn was this the basement and the kitchen's down there and it's small. Uh, too small for the walk-in uh, freezer or the walk-in refrigerator, which you have to go out in the hall and down the hall to get to. Um, I was standing at the counter and cooking and I all of a sudden got like chills. And then I really, to be honest, this is one of those experiences. I felt the presence of my parents and grandparents with me at the White House. 
as I was cooking. And I really do believe that I was there like care because of them, carrying them on because they cooked, they passed it down. My father cooked, which dads in the 50s and 60s did not cook unless they barbecued. My father cooked, my mother cooked. It was, um, I was really part of just channeling them. So it was really a very special experience. I not love to you have it's nice. such a beautiful memory. And Susan, you've got some uh, love and Sephardic solidarity from Minneapolis from Stephanie Levy in the chat. Um, she says she's watching with my family child care kiddos, so have to keep muted. This is wonderful. I am of Sephardic, Mizrahi, and Ashkenazi heritages. I sing and cook from some, all of these. I recently translated a couple of Sephardi recipes into Demotic Greek for my online Greek class assignment. The spirits are with us. So. Wow, thank you, Stephanie. That is so nice. I would love, you know, if um, uh, you would like my email, I feel very comfortable for uh, any, uh, Sarah, for you to put my Gmail in. I can in. share it in the chat. S-H-R-S-2, right? S-H-R-S-2 at Gmail. Yes, at Gmail, right. And anyone who would like to contact me um, further about any of this, please feel free to. Thank you, Stephanie. That's so lovely. Yes. Um, we love the Sephardic heritage. And one last question um, before we uh, wrap up, because I know we've got um, a couple of minutes left, um, and then I'll actually turn it over to Michelle Hamilton to just say a few words about the pre-modern food group. Um, so the last question is, do you know if there will be a Passover Seder at the White House this year? Well, if there is, it's private because there's no people being invited because of COVID, but I'm very hopeful for the future that either the White House or the Vice President's house, which is just, you know, not even a mile away down the road, be there so easily. Um, yeah, I'm very hopeful that both will be doing a Seder. Now the Obama Seder was private. It was not a public event. 20 to 25 people, or 22 to 25 people in a private dining room at the White House. And it was lovely, truly lovely. You know, you just, I will never forget hearing um, President Obama booming out, we shall overcome as part of the Seder. Or his reading parts in English of the Haggadah. It was just, you know, gives you chills. I don't know what will be. We'll see. Yes, well, hopefully it'll be wonderful and filled with many delicious Sephardic recipes. Um, thank you so much, Susan, for being here today and sharing these recipes with us and all of this amazing information. I know for me that uh, it's always a joy to listen to you speak. So I was just so thrilled you could be here. Um, and again, for the folks who missed the first part, um, who are, had trouble with the Zoom link, we do have a recording. So we will be sharing that um, with you all. Sarah, can I just say one thing? As the next person is talking, I'm going to be taking out the cookies. And what I'll do is I'll turn one over so you can see what I mean by the bottom. And you'll just look visually. I won't talk. Great. Beautiful. Well, you can, you're welcome to talk for sure. Yeah, thank you all <laughs> thank you. so much. <laughs> Amazing. Cool. Michelle. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say thanks. And um, thank you, Susan. Or Miss Baracus, <laughs> that was really wonderful and um, really great. I'm a, um, a scholar of medieval Spain and the middle medieval Sephardim. So it was really, really a wonderful talk. So I can't thank you enough. I'm sorry about the snafu at the beginning, but you know, we put, put into the chat how people can find the beginning. And um, also this is part of a larger uh, food group. So we've been looking at the history of food ways and the history of ingredients and, and methods of teaching so or of cooking which I think your talk really really um, speaks to a lot of um, what we've been looking at and thanks Sarah for organizing it so I'm I'm gonna um, callarme. I'm just gonna be quiet now because I want to see the cookies which really look great <laughs> um, but thank you thank you again and I can't follow up to cookies right so that's that's really wonderful but thank, thank you. you thank you and by the way if you found any you know, errors in my talk or anything you, that you have found is not the case, please let me know. I mean, you, you know, as you know, as a teacher and, and a scholar, you always think you're up to date on the latest research, but not always. You know, it can always, something can slip. So I'm happy if there's anything you'd like to speak to on that, just let me know. Oh, no, I think it's great. And I can't recommend, um, 
you know, uh, David Jitlitz and Linda Davidson's book, A Drizzle of Honey, anymore, and that you used it. And I think it's a fabulous resource. And, you know, sadly, we lost um, David this year recently, and um, Linda also in the fairly recent past. So no, I think um, that's a great text and I thought your your talk does a really good job of sort of framing Sephardic cuisine and the diasporic context right which are really so exciting so anyway so thank you and <laughs> sorry to join late but I'm going to go back and, and check the beginning okay thank you so much all right it's time for the big reveal let's see before we leave each other if they smell good I can tell you that Okay, let's see if uh, they're brand new out of the oven, but let's see if I can just flip one over. There we go. Okay. Ah, there we go. Can you see, uh, let me put it against yeah. my yeah. Just that little bit of browning. You want that um, because you want the cookie to be cooked through and in 325, 20 minutes is not a lot. So um, yeah, so that's that. I wish I could give you all cookies now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that too, There's, they look so good, Susan. This is amazing. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you again, Susan. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks to the Pre-Modern uh, Food Group, Center for Jewish Studies and SPRG. Um, again, if you wanna see uh, this recording, it will be on the Center for Medieval Studies um, YouTube channel. So you can catch the beginning there. Um, and we have our next uh, pre-modern food group event coming up on the 18th. So be sure to check out emails for that. But in the meantime, thank you everybody and have a thank great you. Thursday afternoon. Thanks, Susan. <laughs>